Okay, then today we have a file to download. So go to the schedule. Ooh, probably should download it already. Faculty.xlsm. Just go ahead and download that. This is a list I made last year of all the faculty from the BYU faculty directory. Which means that there are some that have retired, like Steve Albright. He retired at the end of last year, and so he's no longer here. And there's probably some that have, have been hired this year. They don't show here. We'll have to update this before too long. But uh, here we have kind of two things. One, we have the list of faculty. And then two, we actually just have the results of a web queries. And Control-Shift-F, I think, will invoke that. So if we wanted to look at my information there, just select the ID over here in column A, Control-Shift-F. And that should go out to the, to the Merritt Schools directory and should bring in the information for me sometime today. And as slow as it is, we probably won't actually do anything with that in class. But um, the, the interesting thing about the code that's here is that with the new way that they're doing the web query um, in VBA, you can't pull data off that page unless it's in a table. And so the code that's behind here, it just pulls all the data in from the page, from that web page, and dumps it onto a worksheet. And so it's kind of a nice example. If you look at the code, you'll be able to read and understand this code. We won't go through it today. But it's just an example of what if I need to just pull code in just from a, a sheet? There's no way to record that anymore. The, it, it just got rid of that tool. But the code still works. So you can take a look at that and see how it works. OK. Anyone still getting that file down? Here you go. There's a couple of you still, still waiting on. All right, so let's talk about. I'm going to just come into VBA and open up my immediate window. Oh, so today we need to really understand the difference between a function procedure and a sub procedure. So there are there are there. Are, we can create function procedures and sub procedures, which we're going to do here before too long. But there's an analogous. There's something analogous to that just in the VBA language itself. In the VBA language, we refer to them as statements and functions. So in both of these, subprocedure, function, procedure, and statements and function, the word function appears. What's a function? In fact, you could go back to like high school math and give me the definition for function. That's what I'm looking for. So what's a function? Yeah, go ahead. Something with an input and output? OK. As an input and an output. Uh, yeah, that's just what I'm after. That's, functions in VBA don't really have to have, have an input, but they're going to give you something back. How many values are they going to give you back? How many values does the function return? The function returns a single value. And so, uh, and in fact, each value, each input is going to map to a single output. And so that's, that's what a function is. And so the whole idea of kind of function in VBA, whether it's one that we write, which we call a function procedure, or it's just a VBA function, is that it's going to give us some value back. So here's an example. In the immediate window, I'm just going to print a question mark here, and I'm going to, I'm going to print now. And so now is a function, and it returns the current time. And so I said print now. It had to figure out what now was. It went and looked at the, at the system clock to find out what now was, and then it returned that value and then printed it out. And so functions return values. Now, as a... The uh, suggestion we had in the front, normally these take inputs, and that's true. Almost always functions take inputs. So let's do a different function. There's a function called message box. So message box, I'm going to open, put an open in parenthesis, and there's going to be a, a prompt here. This is the only one that I have to put. Um, so let's do this. Do you, I'll put it in quotes, do you want to quit? Hey, not yet. I mean, that's the end of class, but do you want to quit? Question mark. Now, for, the, for, for VBA to be able to interpret this function, I have to figure out what, what the return value is for this function. But along the way in doing this, it's going to display a message up to the user. So I'm going to hit enter. I need to close, uh, close, need to close quote. Oh, yes, thank you. Then. I'll hit enter here, and it will, it will do what that function does. So both statements and functions, they go and do something. The difference is, is that a function returns a value when it's done doing whatever it did. So this is wonderful. Do you want to quit? Do you ever get messages like this from Microsoft? Do you want to quit? What's the answer to that? What's, what, are, what are possible answers to that? Okay. No. 
Yes or no? Apparently, okay is an acceptable answer. You want to quit? Okay. But now this, is the, this function returns a value. What's it going to return? What value is it going to return? It returns one. Can I make it return anything besides one? Ah, I, I don't know. Let's try. Yeah, I hit the, the X. I hit the X. What does it return? One. It also returns one. <laughs> 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 have no option. Now, the reason that it does that seems like a weird thing to do. The reason that it does that is that there's another argument. So my next <laughs> argument, I could come in here and I could put an argument that identifies the button, the set of buttons that I want. I'll put my favorite one. Abort, retry, ignore. Is it in here? Oh, it's the very first one. Abort, retry, ignore. Do we have buttons for that? Yes, we do. Whoops. So I'm going to enter on this one. <laughs> do you want to quit? Um, retry. Ah, but now retry returns four. What does abort return? Uh, abort returns three, and ignore returns five. So three, four, five. So these, and that's the whole thing with a message box. Depending on which buttons you're showing, whichever button the user clicks on, it's going to return a number based on whichever one they clicked on. I mean, the real one that should be here is VB yes, no, or yes, no, cancel. Yes, no is another one. Now, do you want to quit yes or no? That's a reasonable response. Do you want to quit yes or no? If I say yes, it returns six. If I say no, it does return seven. Return seven. We managed to get to everything except two. I think two must be canceled. So let's try yes, no, cancel. In fact, cancel those return it to. So we see in one through seven, just those different buttons that we put on. Now, can you imagine that you don't care what the user presses? In fact, if I don't put the button here, what am I going to get? If I don't tell it which button set to show, what's it going to show? Okay. It'll show okay. In fact, do I care what it returns? If it's just okay, I mean, if it's, can it return anything besides one? We haven't found any way to make this return anything besides one. And so, do I care what it returns? The answer is no. I know what it's going to return one every single time. I don't care. So here's an interesting thing. It turns out this is true for most functions. And this is a mistake. This is a mistake that the good folks who were making VBA back in the 1990s made. They didn't realize they were making a mistake. I'm going to take off the parentheses. Are you with me, folks? If you are checking your email right now, now is a good time to stop checking your email and pay close attention to what I'm about to say. In VBA, when I have a function, I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to send some values off to this function. It's going to do something, and it's going to send me back a value. I have to put parentheses around the argument list. If I'm calling a statement, or if I'm treating a function like a statement, meaning I don't care what comes back, I'm not going to do anything with what comes back from the function, I've got to take those parentheses off. If they were writing this language today, you know what they would say? Put the parentheses on all the time. Because this is a really confusing thing. It's the same statement. Sometimes I use parentheses, sometimes I don't. What's the difference? If I care about the value that it's sending, if I'm going to do something with the value that it's sending back, I have to put parentheses around the argument list. That sounds so arbitrary. I'll, if you want, I'll tell you why that is. But let's, just, let's just play with this for just a second and see how it works. So now, I'm not printing anything, but I'm just going to execute this line. And it puts up the message box just fine. I could change the set of buttons in here. So let me go ahead and put on board, retry, ignore. I'll execute that one. The buttons come up over here, OK. I hit retry. I'm not printing anything. What happened to that value? Did the function send the value back? I'm not entirely sure. I think it probably did. But what did we do with it? Nothing. It came back and we're like, whoo, whoo. It just went right past us and we didn't care about it. What happens if I try to put the parentheses around this? And, and now, see, up here, I'm doing something with the return value. You think about it this way. It's going to figure out what this thing evaluates to. It's going, to, you know, it's going to evaluate to 7, and then it's going to be like dropping a 7 back in the place where the call of function was. And then it's going to say print 7. That's what's going to happen. 
So in this case, it's going gonna, it's gonna to evaluate to 7. It will replace the call to the function with its return value, 7, and it would be just like having a line that says 7 and trying to execute that line. That doesn't make any sense. I'm telling the interpreter 7. I'm telling the interpreter print 7. It says I can print 7. But what, I mean, what if I came up to you and said 42? What would you do? It must be the answer to the quiz. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be I guess I'm going to write it down. I don't understand it, but I'm going to take note of it. <clears throat> so, and that's what's going to happen when I execute this. It's saying, I, I don't know what to do with this. I'm expecting some kind of equal sign here. I'm not sure why it's expecting an equal sign, but, that, but it can't do that. So, if I'm doing something with a return value, you know, I might be saying something like x equals the return value. Great. Now I just put that in some variable called x. I'm still not printing it, but I'm doing something with that return value. You see it? We're okay with this? You ready for something a little more confusing? You're still with me? Let me get rid of this second argument. Can I ask and, a question? Yeah, go ahead. So if it's saving whatever the message box output was as x, can you put like print x right now and it kick back 7? Oh, the question is what would happen if I just said print x? No. Oh, I mean, yes. <laughs> Do you want to quit? Let's just check that. I'm actually kind of surprised that it maintains its value. Don't count on that. Let's see if we can get it to be 7. Ignore. Now print x. 5, yeah. So it is maintaining that. So that would be an instance where it might override it. Variable. Oh, exactly. That's right. Absolutely. So if I have this variable x here defined, whatever used to be there, as soon as I execute this line, it's gone. And it's replaced with the value that's, that's here. With the value that returned. Okay. Watch what happens. Now, this, this one doesn't work. If I, just say, if I just say print this, I got parentheses around it, it says, hey, you can't do that. But watch. You notice how you, ex how you just execute one line? For oh, sorry. Hit enter. Oh. Just hit enter on that line. Yeah, for those of you watching the video, the student asked, how are you running those lines so fast? We're not seeing the mouse go anywhere, or you're not clicking anywhere, I'm just hitting enter on that line, that executes it. Okay, now I'm going to get rid of the second argument. And that statement's not going to work. Why does it work when there's only one argument that fails when there's two or three or four or more? The answer is, is that when it's just one argument, it looks at this in the same, these parentheses get treated like the same kind of parentheses you would have in a mathematical expression. Right? I could say print 4 plus 5 times 5. And that would put that. These parentheses, they're not, there's nothing special, but these are different kind of parentheses because they're the ones that we use to go with a function. But here, it just says, oh, okay, that's a single value. It can take a single value here. No matter what you do to it, that's okay. But as soon as I try to put two values inside that parenthesis and that argument list, that's when it says, hey, unless you're using this like a function, return, accepting the return value, you just can't do it. Question. Okay, this might be a really dumb question, but when do you put the question mark in front of it? Because I noticed you didn't do that with the second one. Yeah, okay, so the question, the question is, what's this question mark? What's this question mark? You didn't even tell us about this question mark. I probably never told you about what that is. Question mark is shorthand for print. So print's just a statement that I can give in the immediate window. So I'm giving you an instruction. Print x, or print uh, 4 plus 5 times 5. And so the question mark is just shorthand for print. And I've typed it so many times that I just forget that that's not normal. But you're right, that's, a, that's an unusual thing to do. So it's a statement that says just print this value. And here, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to show you what if I want to just execute a line, just execute this statement without trying to print it, then that will work. So this becomes really confusing because when I use this like a statement, it works okay with the parentheses as long as there's only one argument. But as soon as I have two arguments in there, then it won't work like that statement. And this is one that when you're just starting with VBA, it's really easy to struggle with. Would you like to know, do you want to know why the parentheses ended up this way, or is it enough just to know that's the way you have to work the parentheses? 
How many are saying, oh, help us understand why this strangeness is? There's like, oh, there's quite a few. Okay. The reason is, is that when this value comes back, we can drop it, we can actually use it to feed another function. So let's do an input box. Right? So input box allows me to accept input from the user. The prompt is enter something. The next argument is the title data entry. The third argument then is a default value. What is it? What's what's this input box going to start off with? Let me just play it up here. Let me just put a let me put a seven in there for right now, so we can see how this works. Let's hit enter. And so I mean, here's the prompt: enter something. The title data entry, and there's the default value: seven. Perfect. Well, any expression that evaluates to 7, I can put where that 7 is. So, you know, I can put this, a message box, right where that 7 was. So let's do this. I'm, I'm not going to put it there. I'm going to put that in for the title. Let me go back to 7 on this one. And right where the title is, I'm going to... Now, it turns out this message box is only going to return... See, abort, retry, ignore. What is that, 4, 5, and 6? So let's think about how this is going to execute. We're trying to display up this message box. We're trying to print the result of this function. Before it can display the message box, it has to figure out what all the arguments are. This one it figures out, no problem, string literal. This one, numeric literal, just fine. This one, it goes, oh, I don't know what that one is. What do I have to do to figure out what this one is? Or what does the interpreter have to do to figure out what this one is? So it's got to display a message box. Wait for you to choose something. That value now is going to come back here into this, into this argument as either 4, 5, or 6, depending on the button I press, and 4, 5, or 6 will show up in the title of this input box. So far, so good? You might be asking, why would you do this? You wouldn't really do this. This is just to demonstrate the problem with the parentheses. So I'm going to, I'm going to run this. It should ask me, do I want to quit? I'll choose. Oops. I'm going to hit enter to run this. If you want to quit, I'm going to ignore that question. That sends back a five, and that then goes into the second argument for the for the input box. It was really common to say I've got some function, and what are the arguments for this function? Well, it's some other function. This and, and that, that function could have arguments for this function. Now, here's the reason why we have to put parentheses. The message box function takes it takes can take zero and has to have one. It takes one, two, or three arguments. Let's see what happens if I take if I just take the parentheses off of this one right here. What happens if I try to take these parentheses off? Now, message box says, okay, great, here's message box function, but here's the problem. The message box can take one, two, three, well, actually, or more. But so the question is, this one has to belong to the message box because it has one required argument. But what about this one? Who does it belong to? Does this belong to the message box, or does it belong to the input box? And the answer is, without the parentheses, we have no way of knowing. With the parentheses, I can say, oh, hey, these, these arguments have to go to this function. And so that's why you have to have the arguments. Now, on a statement, that's why you have to have the parentheses when you're using it like a function. It's because I can take a function and I can drop it inside of another list of arguments. I can't do that with a statement because a statement doesn't return a value. It's nonsensical to put it as an argument to some other function. Because a statement cannot go into an argument list, when they're making the language, they're going, you don't need parentheses when it's a statement because it can't go somewhere where it's going to be confused. It's going to, it's, all the arguments are going to be right here. And so they said, look, you don't need them, and so we're not going to let you put them on. I mean, th those parentheses keys, first of all, if you look at the keyboard, they've got a 9 and a 0, and those keys are kind of small. How many parentheses can you actually cram into one of those little keys on your keyboard? I mean, they're going to run out eventually. And they want to make sure you don't run out of parentheses. And so they said, well, you're not going to have to type them. Because on a statement, you don't need them. That was the choice they made in 1995. It was a bad choice. Because now... It's going to be like, wait a minute, when do the parentheses go on? Wouldn't it be better if you just say, the parentheses always go on? They don't. Question. So, 
So if you're to take off the parentheses in the input box and take off the VB abort, or I retry ignore, would it not return that one since it's not a statement on the input box? So you want me to do this right here? Yeah, and then take off that VB abort retry ignore. Because so that is only reading a statement. So now that it's only a statement, will it not give it a one? This is still a function. Um, and it's syntactically correct. I got the parentheses around here, so it knows. Oh, okay, function. You're gonna return a value. Did you want to put something back up? If I take these off, yeah, it's gonna it fail. So it's, you can't do this. It requires a function. Yes. Yeah. I can't just drop. I can't just drop a statement into this. If I put those parentheses back, it should it should work fine. Well, it's going to try to print it, and it's going to say, "Hey, I can't print this anymore because I don't have the parentheses for it." But I'll run this, and that should go okay. So it's going to put one. So it should put a one in the title bar of the next box, which it does here. Okay. So if you're doing something with the return value of the function, you've got to put parentheses around the argument list. If you're not doing anything with the return value of that function, or if it's a statement, it doesn't return, this doesn't return anything, no parentheses around the argument list. I think I've belabored this point. But it's a tough one. It's one that I've learned you don't really understand. Well, good luck. And I'll be here to help you along the way. All right, questions? Yes? Can you define what a statement is? Yeah, so a statement. So, if you can think about it, we've, we've written lots of sub-procedures. That's like us creating our own statement. So, it's, 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 a, it's a name for a set of instructions. So, we, when we create sub-procedures, we're like making our own statements. And in fact, we use them just like a statement, right? This thing is called get faculty. I can now call here get faculty. Get execute. It's just like any other statement that's part of the VBA language, but it's one that I created. So a statement is a named set of instructions. There are a hot load of statements built into VBA. In fact, on the cheat sheet, you can see the first ones here. VBA statement. There's one called beep. And you know, I can just say beep. I don't know if you'll hear anything. Oh, no, you won't because my microphone actually takes over the speakers. So you won't hear my computer do that, but you would hear your computer beep. You put in beep and hit enter. It would just, it does the default Everybody. sound. Someone should do it. Anybody? Beep, execute, anyway. There you go. Oh, one more time. There we go. They're kind of quiet. So, so the statement just says, go and do something. Function, same thing. Go and do something, but what? Yeah, when you're done doing whatever you do, send something back to me to work. So, you know, one, one function, come here to the set of functions, just an example of a function. It's going to be like square root. S Here's the functions. SQRT, I think, is square root. S, no, it's SQR. Okay. So SQR, 622521. I give it some number, and I ask for the square root of that number. It will do the calculation and bring back the square root of that number. Square root of 120, uh, square root of 25 is 5. So again, the function just takes an argument, it doesn't have to take an argument, but if you give it an argument, it takes that value, does whatever it does with that, and then returns the value. All right, so we've got a couple of, let's see, what we've got going on here over here in my educator. Uh, chapter 8, understanding functions, using VBA's functions. So let's take a look at a couple of, just a couple of functions. So one that we've seen so far is now. In fact, you can always put the parentheses. If, if a function doesn't take any arguments, you can always put the parentheses there empty, and it'll be just happy. It'll be just happy with them. It's probably a good idea to do that. There's another one. R and D returns a random number between zero and one. In fact. If you ran R and D, you might get exactly the same random numbers. Anyone do that and get exactly the same random numbers that I did? 
Are they exactly the same? Yeah, the first one I did is 0. 0.7055475. Yeah, I got point. I got your point five five or five three three four two four. That's not the team's not so random after all. <laughs> Turns out, and this is true of all random number generators in the world of computing, is that getting something random on a computer is a really hard thing to do. <sighs> I'm not sure we need to spend a lot of time about this, but let's get a minute on it. And so instead, what the random what the random number generator does is it. It's a deterministic function that looks to, to mortal eyes like they're random numbers. And what it does is it takes the random number generator in the computer takes the last value that it generated and it accepts as input for the next time that it runs. That's what's happening internally. And so it will generate exactly the same sequence, which is kind of nice if you need to test you know, the same sequence or something. But what if you wanted to say, you know what, seed that random number generator with something that's that's, that's not deterministic. Well, there's another function. Or not, actually, this one is a statement. I should put parentheses on that, even though it works without it. I should be putting a statement called randomize. Randomize doesn't return anything. It execute randomize, and what it does is it takes the number of milliseconds that have transpired since midnight of the day before, or since midnight today, the very first moment of today. And it seeds the random number generator with that. And so once I do that, once I execute randomize, when I come up with random, the next RND function, it's guaranteed, virtually, guaranteed not to be the same number that you get. Unless exactly the same number of milliseconds had transpired between when I pressed enter on the randomized statement and when you pressed enter on the randomized statement. Seems weird. Yeah? Isn't that still totally not random? So it's, yeah, oh well, yeah, it's not random. Because if it's random, there should be a chance they're the same. Oh, there's still a chance they're being the same. Oh, there is. Yeah. And that's if the same number of milliseconds transpired. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Random really is hard. So, back in the early days, it in the 1980s, when IBM had a random number generator where every third number was highly correlated. <laughs> it was like a big stink, you know, when they found out the random number generator wasn't very random at all. We're better now than we were then. Okay. Uh, any other functions? Let's see. There's lots of functions. Let's just take a look at some of the functions we have on here. Where are we go? These functions. EBA function. ABS is an absolute value. A lot of these look very similar to the functions you put in Excel. Yes. Go ahead. Is there more there? Are they all the same? Oh, here's the question. The question is, there's some of these that like, look really similar. Are they all the same? The answer is no. In fact, the languages developed totally separate from each other. So Excel grew up, and basic language grew up, and in 1995, they got married. They, it's been a happy marriage, mostly. Some issues, you know, but, um, and so in Excel, when you want a random number between, a random number between 1 and 0, what's the name of the function, you know? Rand. Yeah, it goes R-A-N-D. So that'll give you a random number between 0 and 1. In VBA, it's RND, and it's just because when, when they were making the languages, someone thought, what should we call it? I don't know, let's call it RAND. Someone else said, let's call it RND. And they weren't even, they weren't even, this, probably weren't even the same company when they are making those decisions. Microsoft write Excel from scratch? Very doubtful. Microsoft has written one thing from scratch in their history, and it was the basic compiler that's the foundation for what VBA is today. That's uh, probably a little too strong, whoever's listening on that. But <laughs> the vast majority of stuff that Microsoft does, they don't start from scratch, right? They buy something. They go, well, that's pretty good. Let's improve it. Or not improve it. Or <laughs> whatever they're going to do with it. <laughs> okay, so you know, if, I, if I put in here a negative one, the absolute value of negative one is one. And so there's a, there's a whole bunch of these conversion functions, converting from one type to another. There's an interesting one, char. So there's a function called char. I give it some number, 65, and it, re and it returns the, the letter or the symbol that corresponds to that particular number. We talked about this last time we got together, how the way that it keeps track of symbol, everything has to be stored in a series of zeros and ones. So how does it store an A, a bunch of zeros and ones, add to some number, and then that number, it uses the charts to make it go back and forth. Um, and so 66, of course, is a capital B. 
127 is 117 is lowercase u. So 33 is an exclamation point. And you can go the other way. You want to know what the, what the ASCII American A S C I I American Standard Character Information Interchange. I don't know what it says. We want to know what the ASCII value of that exclamation point is. It's 33. So CHR and ASC let you kind of encode back and forth between the underlying numeric value of a symbol and symbol value of a symbol. Uh, there's all kinds of other functions. You want to know the cosine of some number? Uh, there you go. Cosine. Here's another one that's a little bit different. I can ask for the day of some date in OW. So now it's going to return. Now we'll return this time from the system, from the system clock. We'll go ahead and put in the parentheses for that one. And it says we're in day number two. Is that right? Is today the second day of the week? Yes. Growing up my whole life, I thought Sunday was the last day of the week. I don't know. When I was in high school before I realized Sunday was the first day of the week. Yeah. Turn the day of the week or the day of the month? This day of the week. Uh, this is probably day of the month. Today happens to be the second day of the week and the second day of the month. You're right. It's the day of the month. That's right. So. Let's put a different date here. Let's put in here 6 6 1666. 2006. That didn't help. Oh, yeah, that's 6. Let's go to. Let's put in 26. There we go. And that should return the 26. Yeah, it's the end of the month. Thank you very much. I can ask for the month. And that's you know, 6. I can actually ask for the month name. Different function. That tells me June. So month name is a function. You give it a number 1 through 12. It gives you the name of that month. Months, picking off the, the date there. In fact, let's go ahead and put it back in now here. It should give us October. So here I've got three functions happening. Now executes, sends its value back to month. Month executes, sends its value back to month name. And then month name executes and gives me It's the idea behind a function. It's going to give me something back. I got to do something with it. Sends with it. Sends back. Now, as we had from the astute questioner on the front row, what about all these functions that we have in VBA? Or these are functions we have in Excel. Turns out you have access to all of those too. The way you get to them is a little bit different. Let's take a look. I think I should put these inside uh, an example so the code actually can see what the work. This one's a little bit more detailed, so let's put it down here. Sub uh, Excel functions. All right, so let's say I want a random number between 1 and 100. Now, I could use some math, take my random number between 0 and 1, and I could turn that into a random number between 1 and 100, or you know, 1 and 63 or something. But there's a function built into Excel that does that very thing. What's it called? Ran between. One comma one hundred. And it, every time I refresh that page, it's going to give me a new number between one and one hundred, pulled from a uniform distribution. Beautiful. There is no ran between function in VBA. But I can I've got Excel right here. Let's just use it. Here's how we do it. I would say work, I want to see, let's do a debug.print of Worksheet function Worksheet function dot, and then I got all my worksheet functions right here. Here's where I'm between. One comma one hundred. Or x equals one to twenty or thirty. And x as an integer. Next. Okay, so this should print off 30 numbers. Each one should be some random number between 1 and 100. Let's go ahead and print x while we're at it. So x comma these. 22nd number was 46, the 23rd was 18, and so forth. So I have access to most of the functions that I can use from Excel by using worksheet function dot. I mean most of the functions. 
Which ones don't you have? The answer is you don't have, you don't, you need to read the book. <laughs> the ones you don't have access to are the ones that are like already built into heaven, that have an analogous function built into VBA. What if I wanted to do RAND, R-A-N-D? Worksheet function dot R-A-N-D, there's no R-A-N-D. It goes from radians to RAND between. It's just not there. So if you look up a function and you're going, wait, it's, I know that if I use it all the time in Excel, it's not here, it means one thing. There's a native function in that you can use and should use. But the only way the reason for that is that the native one's going to execute faster. It's going to save you a couple of nanoseconds. It'll take you 20 minutes to find the name of the function to use, but it's going to save you a nanosecond every time you run. <laughs> Seems like they should have put them all there, but they didn't. Again, you know, some guy makes this decision, and that's what we do. Okay, so questions? Yeah. So how do you get to print 30 different numbers? Or how many different numbers did it print? It printed 30. Well, it printed 60. Because it, I wrote a loop, made a loop here. Okay. We haven't really covered loops yet. So we've, we've used them a couple of times without getting into the details. But yeah, this just says, hey, oh, I meant I can, have I even show you this loop before? If I showed you before next loop, this could be brand new. Yeah, yeah we'll cover that later. Pay no attention to that. <laughs> so I should have used a do loop, one that we're familiar with, but well, it's, it's done now. So let's go ahead and put this one back to random between. Random between one and how many? I'm good. So that's pretty much hmm, what we want to do with functions. We're going to talk about creating our own functions, just not today. I think that's probably next time we get together. So it turns out we can create our own functions for use in VBA, and we can create our own functions for use from inside of Excel. So we can make some really complex formulas, some complex function. We can bundle it up, write it in VBA, bundle it up, and just give it a name, and then we can call that all that functionality from one name inside of a cell. Really kind of slick. All right. Um, I want to take a look at chapter number nine. Ooh, love potion. So this whole chapter is dedicated to manipulating strings. So there's functions that are just for manipulating strings. And this is something that we do a lot of. So let's take a look at our, our list of factors. What I'd like to do is I would write, I'd like to write a loop that will look at this string here, this name, and split this into a first name and a last name. So I'm just going to write here in column C, first name, and last name. And we'd like to write code that will, that will start at row number two, continue to process as long as we have names, and take this string and split it out based on that comma. There's several ways that we can do it. In fact, if I was really doing this, how would I do it? I'd come to the data, I would say text to column, let's say split on the comma, and it would split it for me. Um, so this is kind of baby steps, learning to understand how we use these different functions that are built into the Okay, so. Make another sub procedure called split names. Let me go ahead and, and get my, my loop structure set up first. So let me declare dim r as an integer. I'm going to start r equal to 2, and then I'll set up some do loop. Do and a loop. I'm going to make sure I get myself a way out of the loop. So do until cells, row number r, column number 1, dot value is equal to a zero length string, increment r inside the loop. So now, the very first time I, I hit this loop, we're going to execute this loop until this condition is true. The first time I hit this statement, r is going to be 2, so it's going to evaluate what's <laughs> Look at the cell, row number 2, column number 1, and see if its value is equal to blank. Row number 2, column number 1, it's not equal to blank. And so I'm not going to get out of the loop. I'm going to continue in this loop. Let me just go ahead and print off the faculty names, which are in column 2, so we can see that this loop is working. But print off all those faculty names, that's really nice. So I know now that loop is doing what I want it to do. 
I mean, in terms of its control structure, right? It's, it's looping through the set of data. Inside that loop, I've got one of those values that I can process. And now what I'd like to do is see what does it take to split that name to values. Again, there are several ways to do it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how did you get all the names to show up in the immediate window? Oh, I ran this. So just while well, your insertion point is, the, the question is, how did you make that thing run? And the answer is, insertion point is here inside the sub-procedure, somewhere between the sub and the end sub. Click the green button, the little green play button up in the bar right here, or press F5. Either one will do the trick. I got numbers. Oh, you're, it's probably because you have a one here instead of a two. Oh. So those numbers are in column one, the names are in column one. <coughs> Okay, let's do this. Let's, de let's declare another variable. I'll call it fact name as a string. And now I'll do this. I'm still going to, just before I print these, I'm going to run all those values through this variable. Just, it'll make our other examples a little bit easier to read. We'll say fact name equals cells row number R, column number two. And then I'm just I'm taking the value off the worksheet, putting it into the variable, and then I'm printing what's in the variable. That's just so that I can, as I do these next examples, I won't have to deal with the parentheses that are involved with this cells statement. Again, if I run this, it should run those names off, spool those names off to the immediate window. Go ahead. So Fact name, that's just something we can come up with. That's right. It's, not a... It, it's a variable name. The question is, what's fact name? Where did this come from? And the answer is, we invented it. So it's 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 a valid token. So it's a it's a, it's, it's a valid identifier. It's a valid name for something in VBA. But whenever I create a variable name, remember, in fact, somebody remind me what a variable name is. It was a week ago when we talked about this. But what what's a variable? Something. <laughs> something that stores something. Let's be a little more technical about it. That's right. That'll probably get you through. You know, probably get you at least up to the midterm. I get you through the midterm, okay? But general understanding of what it's doing. But two. There's two parts of a variable. What are they? Nope. So a variable. It's a place where I store something, but the place is in memory. And so it's the location in memory, and it's the name. A nickname for location in memory. And so when I say dim r as integer, I'm saying uh, allocate some memory. This an integer will allocate two bytes. I'm asking the operating system for give me a little bit of memory. It's not a whole lot, just two bytes. Give me some memory. And I don't care where it is, but I'm going to call that location in memory r. VBA is going to keep the VBA interpreter will keep track of the actual address of that memory and the name r. I don't have to think about the address, I just think of it by its name. And so when I say dim, the next part that comes after that is something that I've made up. How's the desk doing? It broke. Right there. <laughs> Looks painful. Um, <laughs> Call tech support. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so now, at this point inside my loop, I've got one faculty name. I've got one faculty name. So if we think about it, uh, what's the first faculty name going to be? It's going to be Adams, uh, Gregory Adams. And so R is going to be 2. This is not blank. And so fact name is going to be equal some, some particular cell's value. Which one? Row number 2, column number 2. And that is right here, Gregory Adams. And so by this time, that's exactly what's in that location in memory. And there's a location in memory with a nickname, fact name, and we've stored Gregory Adams in it. All right, let's set a breakpoint on this code just by clicking in the gray bar out here right on this debug.print. So that should run right up until it hits that breakpoint and stop. It won't execute the line with a breakpoint on it. Just you know, run, do everything up to there. Now that we've got variables, this is really interesting to do. So I'll run this. That line turns yellow, which means it's processed everything down to here. Has it executed this line yet? Not yet. But at this point, I can come to my immediate window and I can ask, hey, what is in memory at the place called fact name? And it'll tell me. I can, I can now execute. That location is allocated. It's given to this program. It has that name. I can just, I can refer to it. It's really nice to be here. It's called being in break mode when I've got that yellow bar. 
I can kind of snoop around and see what's going on. So now what I'd like to do is I would like to try to figure out where is that comma. I'm going to declare another variable, call it POS, so that's short for position, as an integer. Sure it is. <laughs> Here's what I like to do. Uh, we're going to use that in a second. So I'm still in break mode. I've still got my yellow bar down here. So fact name still has Gregory in it. So I'm going to work with this in a, in a less abstract way, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move it into the full definition. So first let me print in string, I-N-S-T-R. In string is a function that will look inside of a string for the occurrence of another string. Now the arguments are a little bit weird. The first one says, where do you want to start looking? I want to start looking at the very beginning of the string, at the first character. What string do you want to start looking in? For right now, I'm going to use a string literal, Gregory Adams, or Adams, comma, Gregory. And then it says, what do you want to look for? Well, I'm looking for a comma. And that will return to me the ordinal position of where that comma is. It says there's a comma there. It's the sixth character. Is that right? There's one, two, three, four, five. Six, yeah. That comma is in the sixth position. Wonderful. Now, because fact name is holding the value Gregory Adams, I can take out Gregory Adams and put in fact name. Right? Fact name. And that still gives me six. Because it looks at this, it's not it's not looking at F A C N A M E. It goes, oh I know, that's a variable. I don't find out what's stored in that location in memory. And that's what I'm going to operate on. Not the name of the variable, but the value of the variable. And so now I'm going to set fact name equal to that, and I'm going to come here and in my code, position equals in string of fact name, starting at the first character and looking for the comma. So now I know where that comma is. So now I'm ready to write out first name separately from the last name. Actually, let's put out the, let's put the last name out first. Where's the last name supposed to go? Column four. Or I can actually use the letters here. I can put in column D. So row number R, column number D, that value is going to equal, hmm. So I'm pulling the last name. What's it going to be? Well, it turns out there's a function that will help me figure out what the last name is. Let, I, let me take off. I forgot this guy. Okay, so here's Adam's break. Let's, let's work with this function here. It's called left. I want to print the leftmost characters of some string. How many do I want? I'm just after Adam's. How many do I want? Well, yeah, but for right now we're working in the less abstract way. Six, yeah. So give me the leftmost six. I've got to comment out this line down here in my code because I want to execute when I have a syntax error. And actually, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it should be five characters. And so this is giving me the leftmost five characters of this string. Of course, Adam's Gregory is exactly what is in the fact name variable. So if I replace that string literal with the variable fact name, while the code's running, while that memory is allocated, and there's actually something sitting in memory at that location, that gives me the same value. Now, what is my position? I think it's six. Yes, sir. So, if I put position in here, by the way, I did a little trick, folks, I didn't quite show it to you. Let's go ahead and do it. So, I, I was stopped right down here on my breakpoint, and I added this line of code in above the breakpoint. Has that line of code executed? When I executed past this, it wasn't there. And so, to get that to execute, I'm just going to drag the little yellow arrow right back up to that line, and then press play again. That will just tell it to continue executing from that point. It'll hit the breakpoint. And so now it's executed that line. It has put some number at the position POS, or at the variable named POS. 
to be able to ask for POS, and it's six. So if I execute this, it gives me not quite what I want. So what do I have to do? Yeah, it's just the position where that comma is, but I want one less than that. And so that's going to give me the faculty's last name. So now I can take that expression there and set column D's value on the current row equal to that. And this will put in, this will write out the faculty's last name. Questions? Yeah? If you were to um, declare a variable using dim inside the do loop, does it does it get like collected off like does it get wiped from memory after the loop is over? Dude. Here's the interesting question. What if in here I declared a variable? Dim uh, uh, last name. Is straight. Is that going to do something strange? Well, the end, yeah, will it live outside of the, can you refer to it outside of the do until? Yeah, the answer is yes. You can refer to it after it's been executed, not before. But it's not, it's not, low, it's not limited to inside the loop. All, it turns out, folks, that every, every time I allocate a, a memory, every time I allocate memory with a declare, connect a dim statement, to make a variable, those all get processed before the first line of executable code runs. So when the interpreter is saying, okay, we've got to run this thing, step one, look across here and find all the dim statements and allocate the memory for those variables. I mean, based on this, you could put it inside an if loop or something and it would never actually execute. It doesn't matter. It allocates memory for it anyway. Every dim statement gets memory allocated for. And that happens at the very beginning before anything else runs. And then it starts executing code. For that reason, I prefer putting all of my dim statements right at the top, because logically that's where they happen. They happen before anything else runs. So I like to have my dim statements up at the top. Up at the top. Some people say, you know what? I'm going to use this variable right down here, this little localized area. I want to dim it right here so I can see that it's declared here. This is a different preference. Now that I've declared that variable, I can't change it. That's one of the things that will cause you to have to, re, to restart your code is if you change what memory is allocated. You can add new variables, but you can't change them while it's running. If I'm going to delete that, it's going to say, oh, you're going to have to reset your program. So I'll just run to give you this one. Okay. So now, let's go ahead and do the last name. Last name's a little bit different. Any thoughts on, you know, based on how we got the, I'm sorry, the first that, name. That one was the last name. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, first name. Which is the, it's the second name, it's the last name shown, which happens to be the it's last name. Anyway, we went for the first name. Yeah. Any thoughts on how we might do this? Yeah. You can use the write function and the length function. Okay, so there's a, there's a, there's a function called write. So let's just look at this. How, what will we have to do here? I'll change left to right, and instead of five, how many do we need? Six. Looks like seven. <laughs> seven. And that pulls off Gregory. So my position is six. So it's kind of tempting to just say, well, six plus one would be seven. But that would just be coincidentally the right value. And so oof. how am I going to arrive at this seven? And you're saying I could use something with the length of the string. So what you're saying is if I take the whole length of the string, Let's go ahead and ask what the length of the string is. There's a function for that too, called len, L-E-N. What's the length of that string? It's 14. So I did the whole length of the string, and I chopped off wherever that comma was, I think whatever that was, and threw that away, then I would have just what's left after the comma in terms of, in terms of the, the number of where we are. So if I took the length minus the position, that would give me an eight, I'm pretty close, and from there, I could just say plus one. And then you do one. Thank you. Minus one. And that will give me those seven characters that I'm after. And this will adjust, you know, depending on how long the last name is, how long the first name is, that should do it. So I can take this whole expression here that returns that seven that I'm after. I could drop that in where the seven is. That's giving me Gregory. I can change the string literal down to the 
faculty name, National Bridge Map Directory. So this then will pull off everything to the right of that first comma. There's only one comma, but to the right of that comma. There's an easier way. Let's take a look. There's a function called mid. And so if I look at the middle of some string, it takes two arguments. It takes a starting position. Why don't we start at the eighth character and take four characters? So mid says, look at a string, start somewhere, and return some number of characters. So that looks at the eighth character and returns the next four characters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the place it's going to start is the G, and it's going to return four. One, two, three, four. And so mid takes a starting place, and then how many characters to bring back? What happens if I bring back more than there are? There's not 40,000 characters in that string. So it'll go, okay, stop when you get to the end. In fact, if you don't supply the last argument, it'll start from the place you tell it to start, and then return the whole rest of the string. And so instead of having to take the rightmost characters, and then subtracting off the length and such, we can just say mid of fact name starting at position plus two. Why is it plus two? Yeah, because six is the comma, seven is the space after the comma, eight is that first character. So we're assuming that there's a comma there. Probably a pretty good assumption. So either of these two will work. Which one do you like better, the mid or the right with the length? Yeah, mid's a lot easier to read. So I'm just going to drop this in. It's going to be after faculty name, after position. So this is going to be column C. It's going to take the should pull the first name. All right, I'll stop my code. Click on the little stop button up here, take off my breakpoint, and then run the code again. And that should run down and fill in all of those first and last names in my data set. Looks like it looks beautiful. Question, go ahead. What was the function that you wrote out to get the Excel native functions? Those functions that are native to Excel but not to VBA. Yeah, those are worksheet function dot man or worksheet function dot. <coughs> Let's take a peek over here and see what other what else we're talking about. So there's, there, there's, a, there's a whole host of string functions. Uh, it's replacing one that's kind of important. Maybe we'll just do this in the immediate one. So we have a string here. We'll do it back now. I'll make a substitute. Sub replace demo. S as a string, so we put a value into S. Actually, let's do it this way. We didn't do much with a constant. I'll do it. I'll just do it here, just so we can get some exercise with the constant declaration. Const S equals to Nephi seer of olden constants exactly like a variable. What's the difference? Yeah, once you declare it, you don't change it. I don't have to give it a type because the interpreter can look at that and go, oh, yeah, string data, no problem. I'll make it a string. Because it knows it doesn't have, it doesn't have to anticipate what's coming into this variable. No, it knows what's in the variable. It's not, it's not going to change. It can't change. It won't let you change it. You try to change it, it'll just say no. Let's unplug something.
Okay. So debug dot print s and shouldn't be a surprise that it just prints up to Nephi serial all the time. Now I'll make another variable called s2 as a string. And I'll set s2 to a value. s2 equals. Here's the replace function. The replace function is fabulous. The replace function lets us start with some string, s, look for something in the string, me5, and replace it with something else, lemuel. This will look at the string s, find every occurrence of any PHI, and replace it with lemuel. Now I'll print s2 instead of s. Is replace or replace? Replace. It might be hard to see from back there. Let me darken it in for you. Replace. <laughs> And so it really does find every occurrence. This one, you know, there's only one to find, but if we put something else in here, it'll replace them both. So that's the replace function. Case sensitive, what do you think? Is it case sensitive? Let's put this one as lowercase n over here. If it's case sensitive, it's only going to replace one of those. Ooh, it's case sensitive. Truth is, typically when I'm comparing strings in VBA, it's going to be case sensitive. Now, this, it turns out this function has another argument that I can use to tell it whether it be case sensitive or not. Or not. Oh, but the first one is, start. where do you want to start? I want to start at one. The next one is, how many times do you want to replace? Replace them all. Negative one means replace them all. And then the compare method is VB text. If I change this to VB text instead of VB binary, that next argument, it will now be case, do a text comparison, which is not case sensitive. So now this one should replace them all regardless of the fact that case doesn't match. And are you just saying return? How are you executing? Oh, how am I executing this? I'm executing that with F F5. Okay. Same as clicking on a little play button. It just executes whatever procedure you're still in where your, where your insertion point is. The book talks about another function here that's really powerful called split. Split's going to take a string and it's going to chop it up into little pieces based on some delimiter that you give it. Trouble is, what it returns is called an array. We're going to spend two days understanding what arrays are. So we're not going to do that today. In fact, the book probably says something like, yeah, just, just you know, smile about this one. We'll talk about arrays later. We have a part of the book. Puts them all there so that once you do learn arrays, you can have all those string functions in one place. What else have we got going on here in the book? Placing parts of a string, changing the case. Here's another way to do a case insensitive comparison. Sub case example const pres equals Kevin. Debug.print pres equals Kevin. This is a little bit weird. We have to remember that the equal sign means different things depending on how it's used in VBA. In this case, it's just assignment. I'm taking this value and I'm saying this is going to go into this constant. Here, this expression is like something like this. Print 5 greater than 6. True or false? That's false. How about 5 equals 6? True or false? How about 5 less than 6? True or false? True. So I can do the same thing with strings. So this is going to print whether the, the constant, the location in memory named pres, which is capital K-E-V-I-N, is equal to K-E-V-I-N. And what is it? True or false? Answer is false. Because? Because case sensitive. 
String, car string comparator case sensitive. So there is a function called L case, lower case. It just takes whatever you give it, it will return the lower case equivalent of what you gave it. So I pass it capital Kevin. Now I can't change the constant. It doesn't change the constant. It returns a value based on the constant. And so this is going to be a lowercase Kevin equals Kevin. What do you think the answer is? Yeah, the answer is true. So lowercase of capital Kevin equals lowercase Kevin. So that's kind of a quick, easy way to do a case insensitive comparison. Just push both of your expressions on both sides equal to either uppercase or lowercase. And the case sensitive. Book gives lots of other functions to deal with. Uh, am I going to expect you to memorize those for the midterm? A couple of them, but I'm going to tell you this one's there. Uh, but it's there for a reference. And plus, you now have the reference. You can list them all. Okay, questions? Feel free to fill out the survey for today. Give me some feedback. I'll do oh, one more thing to tell you, and that is I'm now posting your attendance. So if you look on Learning Suite, at the very bottom there should be an assignment called Absences or something. And it should tell you how many absences I have reported for you for the class. So if you, if you have never missed and it says Absences too, you've got to come and see me. But I think we went through and there are only a couple of you that put something besides your, your net ID. It looks like you've all got that figured out now and we're good going for it. So take a look at your attendance. If it's great, don't say anything. If it's a problem, come and see me. Last dismissed. Um, I have a question about the Fibonacci.